So, this is going to be a conceptual one. <laughs> no, really. Uh, today's video is the drivers of the evolution of carrier air groups, and I know, that sounds like a mouthful, and I'm fairly sure this will not be one of my videos which does the best when it comes to views, because the title. But I'm going to leave it the title, because giving it a short, snappy title, or saying... <sighs> Well, my PhD thesis title was What Value the Dark Blue Sky? I rather like that. This one... Creating the Dark Blue Sky. Maybe. The thing is, carrier air groups have changed. And it's quite right they've changed, but honestly, they also haven't changed. It's one of those things when I'm having this discussion with people, they go, well, you know, uh, information warfare, that's modern. Really? It is? Information warfare is modern? You give people a set of information keep giving them that information, and then they make a certain decision based on information, because that's the pertinent information, that's a modern thing. It's not a modern thing. In fact, information warfare, i.e. the form of manipulation of, pop of, of vast populations or small groups, has been going on for as long as humankind have been there going. Let's be honest, Here's how it used to go in information warfare. Some would sidle up to someone else and go, Have you heard the latest gossip? Have you heard the latest gossip? And that's it. That's it. That, that's, that's information warfare for you. The fact that modern means of it have grown, the fact that you've got social media and all these things to spread it out, means it's evolved and it's got wider area effect and you can have all sorts of deceptive imagery and all these things. But, again, that's nothing new. It's just the means of producing it. It's been around for a long time. When I talk about the First World War and the British... A decision to actually invade, uh, to actually send the BEF to France. People often sort of go, oh, the decision making in 1914 is terrible. And I go, no, it's, it's not the decision making in 1914. You have to remember that the British Army has been doing a campaign of raising their status and trying to implement, get themselves involved in things and more seem more relevant because the Navy swamped them completely politically for about the last 25 years at this at that point. They've had a staff pumping out r reports to the ministry, uh, to members of parliament and members of the government f almost on a monthly basis about what they can do and what they need to do in a European conflict for about the previous decade. And since 19 from 1907 onwards, they have the Imperial General Staff, which does it for the entire empire and dominions, talking to colonial governments. And in contrast, the Navy is still back in the period of early 19th century period of Nelson and Nelson, etc. mode of, trust me, my lords, we know what we're doing. And here's a book on history. Please read it. It will explain all our concepts to you. But we're not going to share our actual plans. No, no, no. We don't actually write our plans down. By the time they get in on the staff, uh, staff production and the staff work, it's far too late. That staff is now fighting an uphill battle of mountains and mountains and years and years of documents coming from the army. And it doesn't matter the strategic realities of Britain in that period. It doesn't matter who's in charge. Decisions have been made a long time ago. That's information warfare. That's conflict management. That's shaping the discourse and the nature of the conflict. Doesn't matter whether it's an internal political conflict or a wider war fighting conflict, that is shaping it. So if those things have all been around a long time, you know, carry air groups, they're, 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 they're surely new, aren't they? 
surely they've only been around for, what, a hundred or so years? Surely, surely they are new, surely this is all something... Well, no. Pretty much, carriers start as a means of reconnaissance, counter-reconnaissance, and strike. And that's pretty much, well, there's a bit of force security added in as well, I suppose, in terms of anti-submarine warfare, but that could also be considered a form of strike and reconnaissance, because it's reconnaissance in finding the submarine and it's strike in taking it out. And it's counter-reconnaissance in taking out, because also that submarine could be a tattletale revealing your position to strike aircraft. So, um, it, pretty much they've been the same from the beginning. The methodologies and modus operandi might have changed. The you know the, the aircraft involved might have changed. The carrier groups, the what you expect and the ways the aircraft perform might change. But actually, when you look at what they do in the core, it's been the same the whole way through. So if the core hasn't changed. What evolution has there been in carrier groups? Mostly it's been technological, but also it's been adaptation of that core to reflect the new technologies. Again, one of the misconceptions about war and about military history is that technologies revolutionize war. They don't. They evolve it. Revolution is, where, is usually something which can go around again. Evolution is something that goes forward, it doesn't go back. People look at the current conflict going in Ukraine and go, they're using trenches, it's back to World War One. It's not. Trenches never went away. And trenches have been around a long, longer than World War One. There are basic methodologies of siege craft which go right back. You know, you can talk about Romans, Chinese, you can talk about all sorts of ancient civilizations digging pretty much trenches in order to get up to city walls. So, yeah, trenches, they haven't gone away. You might have thought they've gone away because people haven't been talking about them, but they haven't actually gone away. Foxholes are a form of trench, let's be honest. They are, they're digging small trenches, individual trenches, but they are still a form of trench. It's all the same idea of getting yourself below ground level to give yourself some protection from enemy artillery and enemy fire. It's all about force security. So, this is one of the things about military history and naval history. Systems don't go away. They evolve, they change, but very rarely do the things disappear. We talk about the battleship going, the capital ship. Well, that's because its major advantage over the carrier was its rate of being able to get explosive down in a rate within a range. Once the carrier can outrange it consistently at a long range, that is the uh, the advantage goes to the carrier. However, this is where railguns become interesting and all these systems because if railguns come into service and reduce, A, the cost of those shells the battleship could be firing, and B, reduce, or rather a gunnery-focused capital vessel, a capital ship, I should be getting my my phraseology right, because they won't want to call it a battleship, they'll want to call it a, some sort of gunnery-focused capital ship, so they'll come up with some name of it for it. A literal to medium com a com a combat ship, or something like that. Who knows what they'll call it. It won't be Battleship, though. That's far too low to the name. It's like modern escorts. Uh, modern escorts are our frigates and destroyers. They're the size and duty, doing the duties of cruisers. But we can't call things cruisers. Because that's Imperial. But no. If modern gunnery-focused capital ships come into service and they have railguns and can hit, let's say, targets up to... 
500, 600 miles away consistently, maybe a thousand miles away consistently, rapidly, and bring a lot of explosives to bear, more, far more cheaper than aircraft, they will return. Because the range has got to the point at which now, oh, well, that's a viable asset. I can sit far enough offshore. It's got its own security. It's maneuvered about, and I don't know where it is. And it can bring down fire a lot more cheaply than launching an aircraft to do that job can. But will that mean the aircraft carrier will go away? Probably not. Because you probably still need aircraft for the longer range strikes and longer range targets, whether they're crewed or uncrewed. And the thing is, whilst we can do air-to-air -air refueling of aircraft, and even uncrewed aircraft, we haven't yet figured out how to reload bombs onto aircraft in the air. Let me rephrase that. We did, to an extent, with USS Akron and USS Mac uh, Macon, which were the American starting proto-airship carrier sort of things, which, if they continued them on, could have been led to something very interesting. But, let's be honest, sh that's not really as possible with modern aircraft and modern scenarios than... It was then, and frankly, even then, it was frigging difficult to do. Like, aircraft carrier is far easier to do as a technological challenge. It's actually more difficult to, to um, fly and take off from because of the controlled crash that is landing and taking, uh, taking off from a carrier. But, 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 it is easy to do technologically, and you can carry a lot more supplies on a ship than an airship. With our current technological viability, I know there is someone who goes around going, airships can do everything, and I, I do realise there are lots of potential of airships, but current technological level, and remember, armed forces are conservative with a small c on everything. And let's be honest, the other thing is, it's, it's usually easier to get a airship to crash than it is to get a ship to sink. I'm sorry, it is. I just look at a number of those very large airships which had accidents. Sadly enough. So, as long as you need to rearm aircraft, and also need to do maintenance, if you want to fix their engines, fix their sensors, maybe give them a new sensor package any upgrades you need to do, change their weapon systems out. If they have been having, uh, have been, let's say, they've been air defense focused mission and they've got lasers, and now you need to relate or replace the lasers with bombs, well, you're going to need a carrier to do that. So pretty much carriers are there as long as you need to actually refit and rearm aircraft. Doesn't matter whether they're crewed or uncrewed, you're gonna need a carrier. And as it's going to, by its nature, be very big, because it's more efficient the larger a carrier is, and we'll get into that discussion in this video. Well, you are probably going to use it as your command ship as well, because it's going to have the space. And the information systems anyway to communicate with the aircraft, so all those things make the carrier a sensible command ship. I love history. And tribals, battles, and daring. So, shameless book plug. I do this in every one of my videos. If you watch my videos before, you'll know I do this in every one of my videos, and you'll know the reason why. So, feel free to skip a couple of seconds ahead. If you haven't watched one of my videos before, let's explain. Now, thank you everyone who likes, shares, and subscribes to the videos and helps the channel grow. It really does mean a lot to me. And thank you to everyone who's a patron, who's a, who's a member, who does Kofi donations or does Super Chats, all those things. They all really do help, especially with my book habit, which um, in the last week alone... You know, things happen. Things just appear, even though I'm packing up to move at the moment. But... Why am I pushing my own book so much? Why would I push my own book in every single video? Simple reason. There's a link down below to it on Amazon. But I'm an academic, and I like university. I like being a university lecturer. I like doing that job. But to get promoted, to get a permanent role, to 
do any of the things I like to do in universities, I need to sell a lot of books and publish a lot of journal articles because in the UK, your academic value is directly proportional to how many books you sold and how many journal articles you published. So, no one else is going to advertise it for me, so I will advertise it for myself. Other than the Shipshape crew, they usually do quite a good job of advertising it for me. I'm going to have to take a copy of me on our next trip and make them all sort of do a sort of, I don't know, some sort of um, <laughs> crossing the road scene like the Beatles were full saw just passing the book along to one, from one to the other as we crossed the road. <laughs> that could be fun. Anyway, thank you to everyone who's bought one and thank you to everyone who's considering buying one. I'd really like it if you give it a shot. So, <sighs> this is going to make so many shorts. I mean, literally, there are so many shorts already in this one. Conflict, uh, war and conflict management has changed in the last hundred years. But mm, it's also stayed a lot, a, a lot the same. There are a lot of things which have not changed. There are a lot of things which should have changed. One of the realities that doesn't change is that humans consistently think that people are going to put more value on human life than they actually end up doing. For many of us, it seems abhorrent the idea that human life does not have some special value to everyone, but it just doesn't. That's the first thing you have to learn. And the lives of others can really mean less to some people. So, war and conflict management. Has it changed in the last hundred years? Whilst we like to pretend we've evolved a lot, that we've got a lot more precision focus, that we we do the bare minimum of damage, and I honestly would say we try, they always tried that in the past as well. It's one of the things that's not understood about the past. They want to do the bare minimum, mainly because of three reasons. One, becoming the head of a pile of rubble doesn't really help you. If you demolish an entire country, destroy its population, etc., well, it's going to cost you a lot to actually rebuild it if you decide to do nation building afterwards, uh, if you're not in the business of taking over that country as part of your own territory. And if you're taking over part of, uh, it over as part of your own territory, then it's going to cost you a lot to rebuild it again. Basically, destruction in war... You, it does tell me part and parcel of it, but going too far, doing it wantonly, there is a reason why command structures, especially in professional military organizations, have literally evolved to try and circumvent and prevent this this sort of action. To curtail it, or circumvent it, you know. Just prevent it from happening. Secondly... Believe it or not, allowing such things to take place tends to cause problems in the command structure. Because if you let... War is a dehumanizing enough circumstance that if you let the personnel who are carrying it out, your people who are carrying it out, go too far away from social norms, you can lose control of them. And that tends to be how armies get destroyed. Losing control. So, one of the reasons why you have to worry about discipline, you have to keep these things organised, is because it might sound like, you know, to some sort of means, oh yeah, that they are doing all these nasty things they cross. Yes, they are. They're, they're, they're being really, really, you know, tough soldiers. No, that's that's terrible. You don't want that. You don't want to be in a situation where your troops, instead of the following orders, are instead of pillaging, murdering, doing all those things. You can't control them. They're no longer an army. They're a rabble. You don't want them. So, there is a classic example, a classic example of Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. In one of the towns in Spain, when he took it, now, usually when a siege ends in 
a storming. There is an appreciation at that time that, you know, the troops are out a certain license. Certain amount of license. He, allow, uh, he allows that to go on for not that long before Gallows gets stuck up in the central square. And troops who he's kept back and kept organised are with him. And the point is made. And as time has gone on, the amount of allowing that license has got less and less. Because, again, the, the, the contract, the social contract as well for members of the armed forces has, has evolved. And the realisation that, realistically, if you consider, during that first period after they took the city, if we give Arthur Wellesley's example, he didn't have an army. If the French had counterattacked at a point, if there had been a French army suddenly appear at any point in that scenario, they could have destroyed him because he didn't have an army. It was off doing things it shouldn't have been doing. And it's the same with navies. It's the same in all the time. You lose control of your forces. You lose control. You have to spend a lot more on the country which you are in. And the final thing, final problem, is you are going to be building up problems for future. The, there is always this idea that, oh yes, they're really dre we really dread them. They do a lot of damage. They're really a horrific enemy to fight. So we, we don't want to fight them because they're scary. Ah, that's a good trope in fiction. That is a good trope in fiction. Look at the reality. Usually when you have nations which are behaving like that... I'm not talking about big nations which take over places. They can usually do it. But big nations which take over places, or small nations which take over places nearby them, in a horrific manner. Well, if you know, if you give in, they're going to do it to you. Because they probably will if they're, going to, if they're that inclined. Or you fight, they're going to do it to you. What you tend to do is find a way to fight harder. And it's going to convince you to fight even harder. If you know there is no chance of your survival. Then, you, unless you win, you're going to put a lot of effort into trying to figure out how to win. And the trouble is that tends to get form... If you The more brutal and more vicious you are in those sort of campaigns. And Napoleon's a good example of this. Napoleon managed to unite all of Europe against him. And people go, it's because he took, he, he was, you know, made himself an emperor and all these things. No, that wasn't that. If you look at him on campaign, what does he do? He lives off the land. His troops live off the land. They create huge ravages through territories they pass through. Huge destabilizing effects on the economies. And not just the economies of the countries they pass through, the economies of the nearby countries they pass through, all sorts of things. They, it, it creates a massive problem. And basically, everyone starts to hate him. Because he's destroying them. He's destroying everything. See, you can get away with doing a blockade the way the Royal Navy does it in this period. Because what does the Royal Navy do? They either impound it, if it's French flagged. If it's foreign flagged, they buy it. That doesn't restrict the economy. If you go through, you take the food off the people, and you just march through, and you just live off the land. Shavosh. Shavoshe. It's not good. So... Yeah. Conflict management. Has it changed in the last hundred years? Have carriers got involved? Well, they provide uh, the ability to give you uh, give your forces overwatch for information warfare. 
strike potential, all sorts of things, without being ashore. The thing is, they allow you the unique advantage of ships, which means they are at sea, in, i.e. international territories, and also very difficult for locals to impact on people to really respond to in that regard, especially if their forces have been sufficiently degraded, and allows you to influence events ashore very directly, to reach out and touch them. With impunity, in many ways, especially against nations which are less technologically advanced. Even with peers, they can create a massive problem because let's say your aircraft, ha modern aircraft, have a strike range of 500 nautical miles. And your carrier can do a top speed of roughly. Let's say she's going. Uh, let's say a carrier, we're going to move it rapidly from point A to point B. We'll say it's doing 28 knots. It can do faster than that, but let's say it's going to be a rapid movement at 28 knots. You could hit targets in the morning at one point, and by the end of the day, you could be hitting targets 2,000 nautical miles away in another position. Because the carriers moved and the aircraft moved. And you could hit targets all along the way while you're doing that. That's a big thing, even for countries which are major nations to try and manage against. I know we people talk about some modern shore-based artillery that's designed to engage carriers, anti-ship ballistic missiles, all those things. And the thing is... Again, that's an improvement on the concept, but it's still... You've got to find them to hit them. And they're moving. And the whole point about carriers and carry about, uh, carriers, especially, is that one of their primary roles from the beginning was counter-reconnaissance. Or, counter or limiting enemies' access to information. They have been involved in that from the get-go. That's been a core part of it. Of their development of their evolution because if you can shoot down the enemy reconnaissance aircraft before they can report your position if you can shoot down the enemy zeppelin before it can guide in the, the high seas fleet if you can shoot down if you can sink the u-boat before it uh, signals the rest of the wolf pack where where the convoy is all these things then it's very difficult to attack you and I know today someone's going to say, well, what about satellites? Well, look up the range of weaponry which exists to attack satellites. I know we're not supposed to be militarizing space, but usually that's used on the basis of the weapons aren't based in space. And even that, I'm cynical about. So, let's think about aircraft carriers and the evolution of the carrier group, etc., the first thing to really think about in terms of technology is the size of aircraft. How much bigger they are now than they were then. This is one of the interesting things when people go back to you and go, well, you know, carriers used to be, you know, 20,000 tons. Yes. And the aircraft aboard them weighed in at less than two tons fully loaded and one t and less than a ton empty weight. Modern carrier aircraft, let's see, the F-35B, just about to get a torpedo dropped on it in that picture. Uh, 14 and 3 quarter tons empty it can be over 27 tons fully loaded that's an increase of roughly 1400% over the two that's a lot bigger a lot bigger but whilst it's 1400% bigger in average, it's, in terms of its displacement, in terms of its weight, the aircraft itself is, actually has a smaller wingspan, has a slightly greater length, height is bigger, length I suppose is 80% bigger, so yeah, but compared to 1400%, you know, that's, that's nothing, it's only a, a about a thousand percent faster 
Um, Mac one, approximately Mac 1.6 for the F-35B versus the SOP with Cuckoo, which I'm using as the basis of this, because they're strike aircraft. And whilst I do realise the F-35 is, by the information, is a fighter, and is quite capable in the modern version of air-to-air -air combat, which is basically, we have network systems, our sensors have detected you, we are going to loft a missile in your direction, and the missile is going to have to pull the Gs. Um, it's... People like that say dogfighting has gone away. No, now you're dogfighting with a missile. Uh, it's it's now crude aircraft, or rather aircraft with squidgy organic bit in it, versus uncrewed aircraft. And this is where people find uh, this is where people start to complain about me because they're going missiles aren't uncrewed aircraft. Think about it. Think about it really closely. There might be single use. Range grown 215%. And the ceiling, i.e. the height they can go, has got to 305%. Also, let's be honest, the armament is a massive compared to it. Uh, you've got uh, the, the... The Sop with Cuckoo was the height of technology. It was the first... Carrier developed, carrier focused torpedo strike aircraft. Height of technology for 1918. Truly a world first aircraft. Not the first torpedo bomber, there had been float plane aircraft which we carried out, but the first torpedo bomber designed to operate from a carrier. The Royal Navy had so many plans for Wilhelmshaven. The fact that those plans ended up being taken out against Taranto. And because of the fact that planning had been shared with the Americans and the Japanese, and I'm talking about the original plans of Wilhelm Tarvin, etc., in the early sort of the late part of World War One when they shared things, uh, you have all sorts of ideas develop and percolate from that. But no, the F thirty five carries a twenty five millimeter Gal twenty two A four four barrel rotary cannon. Uh, with 180 rounds, it has hard points, four internal stations, six external stations on the wings. Um, uh, the internal uh, hard points have a capacity of roughly 2.6 tons or 5,700 pounds. The external ones have 15,000 pounds or 6,800 kilograms. And total uh, cumulative capacity they can carry is 18,000 pounds or. 8,200 kilograms in um, total weight, a weapons payload. 8.2 tons. It's a hefty aircraft. It's a very hefty and capable aircraft. And this is part of the reason why carriers have changed. Now, one of the interesting things is in the interwar period, you have a treaty system where technically you really have two varieties of aircraft and carrier. And I would say pretty much you have the small carrier and you have the fleet carrier. And please note, when I say small carrier, I have got into a lot of debate recently about this. The US Navy do not like small carriers in this period, and they even do it today. They don't. Let's be honest. When we're talking about the American capacity of, uh, of things, even their LHDs, which are amphibious warfare ships, not aircraft carriers, I know they carry a lot of 35Bs, but they aren't. They fit into this category, like fleet carrier, not in the small carrier. The reason why the Americans don't like small aircraft carriers is they like large air groups because that fits their doctrine. They use escort carriers during World War II because they have to to multiply their air, naval aviation capability as fast as they want to cover as many territories as they want and support it, not because they want it. The British are slightly more complicated in terms of their approach because they have this doctrine of a cruiser carrier, which is... Uh, evolves into various things. Basically, the cruiser carrier doctrine becomes almost the basis for what eventually becomes unicorn and light fleet carriers, but also escort carriers. And it has its basis in Argus and Hermes and their programs in the interwar period. And that's 1920s and 30s. 
But theoretically, because of the treaty limitations, I, I would love to say that Lexington and Saratoga fit the bill of being the world's first supercarriers. But they don't, realistically. Uh, as massive as they are, in comparison to everyone else, they are 37,000 tons in standard. And you are supposed to be not more than 27,000 tons in standard for a carrier. But they are conversions, they are allowed, and all those things add up. And frankly, it's, it, it's treaty, they're technically on the same category. And they're also conversions and they're not as efficient. So, yeah, the super carriers are post-World War II creation when you've got something bigger. And roughly, you know, this is what we're sort of talking about. If it's 70,000 tons, roughly or less, or down to 50,000 tons, down to 30,000 tons, it's got 70 aircraft or less, and less. It's, it's got usually more than 50 aircraft. And... Again, that's an interesting thing to get into because aircraft grow in size. A carrier might start out at being 70,000 tons and having the capacity for 100 aircraft because it's fly it's designed around things like the size of a sea harrier, which was an excellent aircraft in the Falklands War. But before people get into this video and the debate about Falklands War, about sea harrier versus F-35 or harrier versus F-35, I've done this in a short and I'm going to say this again here. The Falklands War was closer to World War II than we are now. To the Falklands War. In the Falklands War, they took the Sea Harrier. That used sidewinders, did all sorts of fun things. No point did anyone suggest you wanted to get a Sea Fire down to the Falklands and use that instead of the Sea Harrier. Today, for modern navi naval aviation and modern co air defense at sea, and we'll be talking about this in a bit, the F 35 suits modern naval aviation. Far better than the Sea Harrier does. It has nothing against the Sea Harrier. It's just you're talking about something which is very different. We are 42 years from the Falklands War this year. 42 years. The Falklands War was 37 years from the end of World War II. There has been a lot of technological change in that period. And the big thing is the aircraft carriers. But also, this is the problem when you're designing aircraft carriers. Because you go, yes, with this big aircraft, we're going to take all these aircraft. And then the aircraft get bigger. And there are also variations, because if you consider the British carriers, the British always had far more bases around the world, so they still less some reason to carry spare planes in their aircraft carriers. By the time they were looking at it, they decided to build a whole HMS Unicorn as a forward aviation support ship to carry them rather than the carriers. And there's all sorts of stuff covered by that in the British Naval Aviation Doctrine video. The thing is, the Americans and the Japanese are looking at fighting each other across the Pacific. And if no one's looked at the map in the Pacific recently, you'll see there's not a lot there. It's really not a lot there. So you take everything with you. And this is when air groups really start to become interesting, because are you counting the aircraft which can actually work? Are you counting the aircraft you have in storage? Are you counting the aircraft you have in components? In your air group numbers. Are you counting the aircraft you can deck park? Which is something you can do with Pacific carri or carriers in Pacific. If you do that in the North Sea or the North Atlantic, though, as the Royal Navy will testify to in World War One, they lost more aircraft in I think it was two years of World War to uh, World War One to the sea nicking at them than they did to enemy action, even though they were doing some quite interesting operations. Which means again, when we start doing aircraft numbers, are the aircraft numbers you're given today about a modern carrier are they how many it can fit in its hangar? Are they how many it can operate? Are they how many it carries in spare parts and etc.? Are they how many it can operate with, including deck parking? And because different navies have different practices on this and don't always explain what they're giving, this can lead to all sorts of wild discussions. So these are rough sections given by me. Okay? They're broadly speaking what I've seen agreed in various other books and various other discussions, but I felt that 
it gives you a good basis for understanding what I'm talking about. So when I'm talking about a small carrier, or I'm saying something like the US Navy doesn't like small carriers, I'm talking about something with 20 or 30 less, uh, 20 aircraft or less in the 1920s, 30 aircraft or less in today. I'm talking something which is less than 15,000 tons in the 1920s and has risen to about less than 30,000 tons today. I'm talking about something like the Japanese mm, aircraft carrying destroyers or the Royal Navy's Invincible class which, of course, had the great designation of through deck cruisers at one point, for a very short amount of time. I know there's a lot of people who've done a lot of studies to try and go, oh, it, it isn't true, or it is true. The only thing I know is that naval architects were calling it that for a short while. So, maybe it was a joke name amongst them, maybe it was just a brief name. Doesn't matter, it was there for long enough that it, um, it stuck. And they've got the Charles de Gaulle. Now, People are really shocked when I say that's in the light fleet carrier. Right? And that's not because J France doesn't have capacity to build more. No. Charles de Gaulle is a classic case of the government are pissed off with the biggest yard in your country. And instead of going to them because they're annoyed with them and building a carrier within them when they could build something which would be really big, they built it in the next biggest and they were therefore limited in size. The current project, they are now have had a rapprochement, or there's new owners of the Dark Yard. It's a, it's a whole debate and discussion that one to work through. Really, it is. Anyway, they are going with the biggest yard. So they're going to get a carrier, which is probably going to be a super carrier. Still going to have one of them. Um, Queen Elizabeth's class. They're a nice modern example of... Britain building a carrier and an idea which really works, and now they're not building at the moment. They're not technically going to build the next the, the phase of it which really makes it work because if you're building an F-35B Vistal vertical short takeoff and landing, and I'll talk through those a bit, landing a carrier rather than a catapult. That's a catapult assisted and barrier assisted catapult assisted, catapult assisted takeoff and barrier assisted recovery. I like these these. And pretty much all of these uh, end up being. Um, it makes sense if you are going to be building something which can operate that same air group, but is not of the same size and scale. So let's say you build some LHDs, landing platform helicopter docks, um, like the America class, or perhaps the Trieste class of the Italian Navy would be more appropriate to what the British probably need. And if you were building two to three of those, then you'd have five flight decks you could operate those same aircraft off. And so the Royal Navy, with only having five flight decks, could always guarantee to have a, air, a flight deck available for air, uh, for carrier-style operations. Uh, even if it's an LHD doing it in a limited role, because it can only do it in a limited role. Or a... And flight deck available for amphibious operations, even if it's a carrier doing it in a limited role, because let's be honest, in amphibious role, they have capabilities, but they are not the same as the LHD, which is purpose-built for it. it. Basically, you basically go with having, oh, I've got five flight decks, two strike orientated, two strike car, two strike carrier operated, orientated, two uh, free amphibious operate, orientated, but they can all, we can operate the same aircraft from all five of them, etc. That's a very sensible approach for a medium power to go. And the British were thinking and toying with that route and now have... It's never, it's not come to fruition. We've built part of it, but not... But in, in classic British government scenario since... I'm trying to remember a time when the British government built what it planned. I think you have to go back to the late 18th century in the height of the Napoleonic Wars. I think that's about it. That's mostly because the British government didn't plan it. The most British government gave money to the Admiralty who then built it. That's a long time ago. And also, if we're looking at sort of the modern carriers of China or Russia or any other country, we can put them in these categories. And honestly, it really does give us an idea of pretty much what they are. Because air groups define what you're going to do. 
If you want to maintain a cap or a strike capability, the broad thing is you need 18 of those aircraft. Why? If you're maintaining a cap, you need four in the air for combat air patrol. You need four in alert. The moment the four are in the air, go off to engage your target. You will launch the four alert ones to take over the cap so that they can be a center target. You need to bring another four up. And you keep cycling, and that's why you need four groups of four. You have two more spare airframes to insert in case of losses or damage that needs to be maintained. And that's the bare minimum. If you want to be really smart, you want to go slightly more. But So if you're talking about an air group with 36 aircraft, you could put in two sets of aircraft, 18 for both, and you can maintain two roles. You can maintain the strike. Okay, but uh, an air, a cap capability and a necessary warfare capability because it's roughly the same. And before anyone starts going, well, no, you know, you, you might not need four. You can do it with three or two with, you know, the helicopters running around. There have been a lot of studies that have come out. And basically, it doesn't matter if you're, you've are got four aircraft, one, or four aircraft running off doing anti submarine warfare, wandering around. Again, when you want them to come back, because again, helicopters need to rearm as well. Helicopters need to, refu uh, to restock sonar boys. Helicopters need to refuel. Helicopters need to change their crews over. H m components of being operated at a high tempo in a saltwater environment need to be maintained and replaced. All these things mean those aircraft need to come back. Doesn't matter whether it's uncrewed or crewed aircraft, it works out the same. Broadly speaking. Okay, we are talking in broad spirit. And when you are defining an air group, you're not going, right then, I want the bare minimum number of aircraft. Not if you're being sensible. You want to go with the broadly speaking numbers to work it out. So if you want to have strike an airborne early warning, uh, well, strike an, a, a, a strike an air a cap, what you might do is go, right then, well, what I want to do is have 18 aircraft roughly for that role, 18 aircraft for that role. If I get the same type of aircraft for both roles, then I have a pool of 36 aircraft to draw from. And that means that I can dual load. So if some of my strike air, if my strike aircraft are back, and I've had suffered lo losses or maintenance needs for my air cap aircraft, then I can send some of the strike aircraft up as cap. If and vice versa, if I need to have send an extra strong strike, there we go. So, so we get the idea of having thirty six F thirty fives from. By the way, code on S. And then again, okay, anti summary warfare, you want about 18. And if you want to have, let's say, some airborne early warning helicopters, that's going to take you up to about 24 helicopters with, the, with six more. You start to see where all the things come in, all the capabilities come in, and all the requirements come in. So, what do you want to do, mission wise, reflects your air group? If you want to generate more than two missions, you're going to go up another 18. For every mission you want to generate up, your minimum growth is going to be another 18. If you want to guarantee that mission capability, you want to go you want to be making jumps of 24. You want to have 24 aircraft per roll. But 18 will get it done. And by the way, the 18 aircraft studies. That dates back to the 1920s. The British, the Americans, and Japanese all did variations on them. And they've moved forward with time. And it's been shown again. Every time people try and get away with less than 18, they run into trouble. Every time. So if you want to be serious about an operational capability in terms of air group size, it's got to be multiples of 8. You're talking through minimum multiples of 18. If you're going for models of 24, great. And let's start off with the original point of carriers. Information warfare. Spotter, reconnaissance to reconnaissance to all those things. Carriers originate as force enablers. That's where they come from. That's where the whole lot of air power comes from. It's a force enabling thing. And information gathering, reconnaissance, spotting, whether that information is basically reconnaissance, i.e. finding the enemy, tracking the enemy, i.e. keeping pace to them, guiding everyone in, or spotting, guiding the fire onto the enemy of battleships, because let's be honest, when they first come in, 
Battleships are far better at killing other ships than aircraft are. They are. This, this might sound strange to say, but in the 1920s, this was probably a far more dangerous weapon system than the equivalents of this at that time. Yes, there are some torpedo bombers. And yes, they could possibly do the damage if they hit the target. But the thing is, you know your battleship shells will do the damage, and you know your battleship shells will sink the target, as long as they hit the target. This makes them hit the target. Today, it's the same. We don't have dedicated reconnaissance aircraft built anymore, as a rule. We, we've moved on to satellites, we've moved on to pods, onto aircraft, usually fighters. But honestly, the big evolution of this has been more of a case of, a, by the traditional problem of a carrier, it's a fixed limited amount of space. No matter how big you build it, there's always a limited amount of space. There's a limited amount of hangar area. And as aircraft get bigger, well, they take up more space and you tend to be your air group size reduces as time goes on. But there's also fixed logistical space, there's fixed store space. So what you really want is to reduce the types of aircraft down as much as possible. Because, let's put it this way. If I have an air group of 72 aircraft, and they are made up of... Six different squadrons of 12 aircraft. Each of those 12, uh, each squadron is a different aircraft type. Then I've got to carry six sets of stores for those aircraft. That's probably not going to be stores to the same level. Because if you think about it, if I've got 12 aircraft of each type, they're going to have different stores, which they got different shapes, different spaces. More importantly... I can only carry stores for the most common problems they could have and need fixing. If I then turn that around, and let's say I have 72 aircraft, but I have 24 of one type and 48 of another type. Well, now I only have to carry two sets of stores. And let's be honest, for the 48 aircraft, I can probably justify, and even for the 24, I can justify carrying far rarer store items, i.e. things which far which go often go wrong less often and with the 48 I can go I, I could justify perhaps carrying one off components of things which very rarely go off or go wrong but I've got 48 of these aircraft so it's efficient and it's more efficient for me to store the stuff so this is the reality you will find this constantly with carriers and a constant p p p p part of their theater and in fact naval aviation has been core driving component to the increasingly multi-role nature of aircraft because whereas on an airbase you can build another hangar you can build another storage hangar you could build an underground storage facility and you've got space to expand it relatively easy if you turn around to an aircraft carrier and go you know what i'm going to do i'm going to um add a carbuncle onto the side a blister onto the side of the hull and use it extra storage, you very soon find you end up with stability issues. And uh, that can cause trouble. So, yeah, you have to just go with the flow on that one. And then there's air defense at sea. Now, this is an interesting one because fighters are probably the aircraft which have gone through the most transitions in terms of capabilities and focus of their skills. One of the interesting things about air defense at sea is very quickly, because of the difference between land air defense, ships have their own air defenses. They have their own heavy AA guns. They have their own light AA guns. They have all those things. Very quickly, air defense at sea shifts from killing targets to breaking targets up. Because ships are such concentrated heavy amounts of AA fire, you want to break up the strike groups. So you want them to be a smaller. So basically, if a ship's dealing with a single aircraft attacking at a time, the odds are in the ship's favour, believe it or not. A single aircraft, one-on-one. -on -one. If it's dealing with a dozen aircraft attacking, well... 
then honestly, the aircraft will always have the advantage and probably win. And it's rather similar when we start talking about today, when we start talking about going, well, if it's single missile attacking a task group, it's frankly not a problem, or at least shouldn't be. If it's a dozen missiles, or two dozen missiles, or a hundred missiles, then we're starting to deal with issues. And air defense at sea starts off with being about, oh, we see an aircraft over there, launch fighters. The fighters will have time to get in the air, get to an attacking position, and attack before the aircraft's got into range, because they're moving at speed. After a while, that isn't good enough. Okay, so you have, actually, the Blackburn. Blackburn, uh, the aircraft at the top here. Airborne, spotting for enemy aircraft coming in, launch fighters. Eventually they decide the idea of, well, actually what we'll do is we'll have the ships, we'll have all the aircraft involved, and we'll also have some fighters airborne, so we'll have a cat. And for quite a long time, therefore, the most important thing for a fighter was his ability to climb. Because once you're into, your purpose is not to necessarily kill, if you kill enemy aircraft, that's great. But your purpose is to break up enemy, enemy attacking forces. You develop a tactic called Zoom and Boom, where literally, you zoom down, and you boom away with all your guns, and you break up the enemy formation. That's literally what you're doing. You are zooming through them and breaking them up, firing your guns. If you hit something, great. If you don't hit something, doesn't matter. You've probably broken them up. Because honestly, seeing a nutter diving at them is probably enough to break them up. And at one, which point, once they are broken up into, let's say they're broken up from a squadron stri a squadron attacking group of, let's say, 18 or so aircraft, to flights of two or three aircraft, or maybe four or five aircraft, and then there's heavy AA also booming away, and that might, well, break them up more, hopefully into one or two aircraft, and then you've got the medium A, the 40 millimeter, etc., booming away at them, rocking the sky around them, filling it with... Hopefully Tracer, once they they work out that's a really sensible thing, because it works psychologically. Um, the whole thing builds up, and the squidgy organic bits are all getting mixed up and mucked around, and frankly being subjected to a lot of explosions, and then finally they find themselves solo engaging a ship. That's the point at which the light air is going in for the kill. The only weapon which is dedicated, where its emphasis is killing the targets, rather than, in addition, it could kill them, versus breaking them up, is the lightest AA. And every single level, they can be killed. They're, they're, not, they're not going to complain. And there at no point is there going to be a gunner officer going to a, you know, a heavy AA crew and going, My God, lads! You killed them! That's not your job! No, they'd probably go, You did a great job with the barrage, and you killed them! That's really good. That's really good shooting of all of you. Emphasis is on the barrage, breaking them up, but I'm going to reward you, sort of scenario. Air defense has transitioned. It's moved on from that. In that, uh, now, we don't do zoom and boom. We went through a phase where we didn't really do zoom boom with aircraft anymore. And today, we definitely don't do zoom and boom with aircraft. We do zoom boom with missiles. Missiles are what do dogfighting. And missiles are what are sent to zoom at enemy aircraft. And if they go boom, well, hopefully that's because they've actually hit the target. But... Even if they don't hit a target, they're probably going to cause them to do some hijinks, expend a lot of fuel, and maybe drop their ordnance to try and get away from them. Because let's be honest, you can't pull high Gs with a lot of ordnance attached. And again, the combat air patrol, it has remained though. But now, the distances we're covering with the cap, it, when a cap first starts, they're literally flying over the carrier. And when I say literally flying over the carrier, I mean they're doing figure of eights over the top of the carrier. Nowadays, they'll be probably doing figure eights or other similar methodologies of holding station with targets with, with your carrier, not targets, which are moving at a very different pace than you can move at. Probably a fairly hefty way up fret. And if you've got enough fighters, you might have multiple caps. You might have a cap as far up fret as you can maintain one. And you might have a cap orbiting over your own 
carrier or orbiting far closer, as sort of maybe one is positioned about 100 miles outside the carrier battle group, up fret, and the other one's 250. And it's the same policy. The moment the outer one's engaging a target, the inner one starts moving in a direction, and you launch the alert one from the flight deck to replace the inner one. Basically, what you want your enemy to be dealing with if they're attacking you is a conveyor belt of fighters constantly launching missiles at them until they get into missile ranges of the onion layers that are the, car uh, the carrier battle group, uh, you know, carrier battle group. And the sheer volume of long-range air defense missiles they're going to be getting, electronic warfare systems causing jam, uh, jam then... Point defense systems probably starting in, guns, everything gets chucked at an incoming air attack. Or theoretically should be chucked. I know some governments have saved money by, let's say, ignoring certain capabilities for guns or other systems. But we're hoping in the next few years, with realization that peer-on-peer -peer conflict might not be the thing of the past they dreamed it was... Uh, they might have got slightly better and might have actually realized that these are things you do need to invest in. Strike is exactly what it says. Strike is about taking out enemy targets. Whether you're using a sop with Cuckoo, dropping a torpedo, the first carrier-based torpedo bomber, or whether you're using a modern F-35. Strike is strike. It's basically the long-range successor to artillery. Or rather, the long... Uh, well, artillery is carried on surviving because at a certain point, with artillery, you need it to provide a certain volume of fire over a specific area, and that's cheaper in that range than it is to launch an aircraft. But long-range artillery fires, long-range strikes, that's the thing. Aircraft have provided that again from the beginning. They have been getting better and better at giving a long-range strike. The first plan the Royal Navy has for its carriers that it's working up is an attack on Wilhelmshaven to go and take out the German fleet in harbour. Yeah, they were having that idea in fervently in 1917-18 in World War One. Then we have anti-submarine warfare. Now, this has been something which aircraft have really grown into. Or rather, aircraft carriers have grown into it. Aircraft were doing anti-submarine warfare before aircraft carriers existed. And having aircraft aboard a carrier carrying it out... That is something which waited till the interwar years from the start on. But this became a very important methodology for anti-submarine warfare, because the whole point is, with an aircraft carrier, you can extend your reach and the density of your air patrols. Because if you think about it this way, if you are launching from a land base and you are spiraling out from it, the frequency of aircraft passing over any area, covering any area, is going to reduce the further you get away from that land base. So no matter how many aircraft you have, you're virtually you would need an infinite supply of those aircraft to try and maintain it. And at a certain distance, it will break off because the aircraft can't go any further. An aircraft carrier, well, that can provide a corridor, well, a virtual moving section of a corridor, around any formation with its aircraft going around it, providing a constant density of aircraft. And the point is, this starts out in a period when submarines are submersible torpedo boats. They spend most of their lives on the surface. If they have to dive, they are using up valuable oxygen, they are very slow underwater, they're not going anywhere. Making, Forcing them to dive is as, almost as good as uh, sinking them. It's a virtual mission kill. It might not be a mission kill for long, because they can do something maybe the next day or the day after that. But it's a mission kill. It's enough a mission kill to be useful. Because again, with them being forced underwater, the odds are the convoy or the battle group can get past. Now, I will say, the thing I'm most annoyed with that has happened is that things like the Viking here, with its magnetic anomaly detector tail extended, this is what this long probe coming out of it is, 
they've gone. We no longer have, and it used to be, it was the mainly the Americans who had it. Let's be honest, it was mainly the Americans who had it recently, and the British had it for a long time with the Ga fairy gannet, but long-range anti-summary warfare aircraft from carriers to give them an outer ring of air defense, of anti-summary warfare. They were a really useful tool. Yes, the modern helicopters are great, and you wouldn't want to do away with them. You would not want to go get rid of them and replace all these aircraft because they are so useful in so many ways. But the thing is, the two, two complemented each other. Because they meant, the in a, kind of like the air defense role, you could have a lair which was concentrated on spotting, driving away, caught harassing, breaking up enemy groups, stopping any sort of large concentration of submarines forming up or causing trouble. You, you could have that, and you could have these actually going out for the kills. And they complemented each other well. And whilst theoretically, if you have a larger pool of these aircraft, they can do both roles, the thing was there was an advantage to having something faster and longer range that could go even further than a, air, than a helicopter could in equivalent time. It was useful. Now, operational support air warfare, airborne early warning. I've already touched on this in the air defense at sea. But honestly, this has got more and more. You've still got aircraft today which exist primarily for air defense, coordination of airborne, air, airborne assets. But let's be honest, the modern Hawkeye, this aircraft, has taken this to a whole new level. And it's almost incorporated spotting back into its duties. It's feeding the data, guiding strikes. It can be going forward with a strike group. Directing their capabilities to in deal with enemy aircraft which try might try to halt them. Especially disadvantage with stealth aircraft because it can steal a, see a very long, rain, a long way. The stealth aircraft can keep their sensors off because let's be honest, once a stealth aircraft activates its radar or any active sensors, it's kind of giving, making itself into a lighthouse. It's a massive beacon showing everyone its position. Not really helpful. So having an aircraft like this long, which has a very long range, a very powerful view, can provide a lot of data to those stealth aircraft. So they can be further up range and can lob their missiles and other things that enemy aircraft or enemy air defenses that are trying to engage long before they spot the F-35 but also long before they can get actually anywhere near the Hawkeye. Now, still, they have their role of defense of the carrier battle group. And again, this is something which is interesting because the number four has got the traditional number for carriers to carry. I would say my view is that with their increasing role and the fact that you've lost some of the other aircraft which might have helped out in similar roles, you might see that actually increase in the next few years. There are some studies I've read which suggest to me whilst 4 is very much the very solid number, everyone's agreed 4 is enough. Everyone has agreed 4 is enough. Everyone's agreeing 4 is enough, but also considering the virtues that 6 or 8 might have. But we're sure four is enough. Electronic warfare is another area. It's a really cool area of capability. Electronic warfare is honestly... Well, it's a new area in many ways. It was a new area in World War One where jamming had started and all sorts of radio communications and things really started to take off. Whenever you say things like a start, you know, people then can point out and go, well, no, there's this individual incident. There's, there is. There are lots of individual incidents. But once you get to something truly being weaponized as a tactic of war, not an individual event, an individual campaign where someone's trying something new, but something which is actually being deployed, there, they basically start off at similar times as aircraft in that sort of, in that sort of scenario. Now... 
one of the things that's been interesting is the development of air defenses and development of systems to try and resist air attack have led to the development of a lot of electronic warfare aircraft. And it's kind of keeps flirting between being pods added onto aircraft and let's be honest, those pods in World War II often considered of mosquitoes loaded with bomb, bomb bays loaded with chaff clouds, literally chaff dispensers. And they would just zoom in and drop a load of chaff. And so you'd be sitting there on a radar screen going, there could be a bomber group over there, there could be a bomber group over there, there could be a bomber group over there. Where the frigate is a bomber group? Which one do I send my fighters after? Modern systems are slightly more capable. And let's be honest, an E-18G like this, well, a couple of them can probably suppress most nations' air defense systems quite quickly. In that, whilst there are some nations who have put sufficient amount of spending and uh, long-term investment in infrastructure into growing their air defense systems to the point at which they can't have that happen to them, the vast majority don't. And these things are lethal. And the really interesting question is with some, with some, has been the idea of well, if the you don't need these in an era of stealth aircraft. And actually, I would say you need these even more in an era of stealth aircraft. Because stealth is viable. As long as stealth is usually orientated around certain types of radar. So you design your stealth around what you think are the most likely radars you're going to have to hit, or have to deal with, or are likely to encounter. These systems are able to suppress what are the other things, the other options. So basically, they're a great enabler for stealth aircraft. And again, probably something which is going to continue to be a major part of the world for a long time. Of course, we also have logistics. Do you want to do search and rescue? Do you want to do to resupply your carrier? Well, yeah, you can have aircraft do it. One of the interesting things that's been talked about a lot recently is replenishment at sea. And it's been coming up a lot recently because many people have realized that you can't, at current implemented technological levels, please note the careful phrasing there, current implemented technological levels, you cannot reload vertical launch systems at sea underway. The Americans did used to have a crane system built into their Tico class, but the Ticarongas, I think the ones which had that have full lost it now, or had it replaced with free cells, um, so they could take some more missiles, because it wasn't something done. And now we're looking at rebuilding the, the idea. But you can resupply aircraft carriers at sea. You can replenish them with ammunition. You can replenish them with things and stores from store ships and keep their air group going. But remember what I talked about with air groups and aircraft about having some very small components, some very sometimes very rare, rarely needed components for aircraft. Well, SOD's law dictates, and the U.S. carry operations, everyone's carry operations shows, that once you have that part go, because you've carried only one of that part, because it very rarely goes, and you replace an air, you fix an aircraft by uh, using that part, within about five minutes, another aircraft is going to have exactly the same problem. Because you now no longer have that part. Sod's Law, Murphy's Law, there's various various ideas and deities this this fact of life is um, ascribed ascribe to, but honestly it just happens, okay? It's just what happens. Again, you if you're ever working on anything, if, for me, usually it's when I'm working with my model railways and there are some components you just have a couple of spares of because they don't go that wrong on model railway engines. They don't go wrong that often. And you find you've used your spares. Okay, fine. Uh, I'm not going to the shop for a couple of weeks. That should be okay. And, you know, I don't feel like ordering from Amazon. And then... Oh, frick it. 
your aunt's favourite train breaks down, the one that they always like to see on the uh, going around the railway when you've got little kids, little cousins out there watching the railway, and the one, the aunt who likes to wander out and look at the railway while the cousins are watching it, sort of be part of the group. The, pl the train she looks for goes wrong and she's coming to visit the next day. It's Sod's Law. And that's the component you need. So you are frantically searching to find out if there's a 24-hour railway to, uh, train, model train store in the southeast of England. <laughs> Sadly, there isn't, but there was one which had a 24-hour answerable no uh, no phone number, virtually, in that they said you can call us out of hours between these times. You, they used to be open. It, it's now it's now closed, sadly. That was such a useful store. Now it's Amazon next day delivery is the only option. <laughs> oh, hey, caramba. But, yeah, th that's the thing. You now have these aircraft. They, the aircraft, they will go and get them. And this is a particularly good example of it, the trader, because... The US Navy at the time was operating the Tracer, which was an airborne early warning aircraft, the Trader, and the Tracker, which was an anti summary warfare long range patrol aircraft, and all three used the same airframe. Another methodology of, well, reducing your logistics needs. After all, it's the same type of aircraft, it's the same spares, it's only different, other, different components. Now, carriers are very good at the presence mission. They're usually quite big, quite large, and quite focused. They also have the ability to have aircraft fly off them and go and say hello to places. All useful for spreading the presence mission. And presence is a very good methodology of conflict management. Deploying an aircraft carrier, deploying a carrier battle group is a major sign of interest, of influence. And of your ability to project power right into someone's back door, backyard. They tend to take notice of it. I would say it's the conventional firepower equivalent of pointing out you have nuclear weapons. If you think about how it's employed. It's a blanket. We've got a carrier coming to this region. Are you really sure you want to do what you were thinking of doing next? You don't tend to use, you know, one of the rules of conflict management is we don't use nuclear weapons as a deterrent with powers who don't have nuclear weapons, which is why Falkland Islands and other scenarios didn't result in nuclear weapons being used. That's basically become the rule of order, as long as it's subscribed to. There's always a chance that someday someone decides to break that contract, but we all hope it's not, uh, it, no one does it first. So, as long as no one has done it, that's fine. I know some people are going to point out, but what about Boeing of Japan? The contract didn't exist then, because only one power really... Well, one alliance of powers had nuclear weapons. I, I know there are various people who like to ascribe it to one nation only, and they like to do it sort of... Or they like to just say, well, no, really, they were using the intelligence of another nation, they were just providing the components, or... It's a group effort. It is a group effort. There is a lot of different studies. People working along the same route to develop nuclear weapons, or similar routes and convergent routes, but no one was quite there. And if you hadn't brought those routes and all the information together, you probably wouldn't have got there when you did. You just wouldn't have. But yes, carriers, they're a major sign of interest. They, you can, you're bringing a range of assets and a range of capabilities with you. A very visible range of capabilities with you. And they usually are deployed as part of a battle group. In fact, they should sensibly always be deployed as part of a battle group because the whole thing you build your force around is the converging capabilities of the battle group. I know there are myths about battleships fighting on their own and all these things, but realistically, you're designing battleships to fight as part of fleet organizations, task groups, task forces, along with cruisers and destroyers and other ships. There is a reason why when the Grand Fleet and High Seas Fleet engage each other at Jutland, it's not just battle lines. They do have cruisers, they do have destroyers, they have whole swarms of ships with them, which are not battleships. 
So, aircraft carriers and the evolution of the air group. It always amazes me how, when you're looking at it from a particular perspective, i.e. the roles and duties we expect aircraft to cover, the air group to cover, the air group hasn't really changed. It's had things added to it, but it hasn't lost anything. The thing that's changed the size of aircraft and the way those aircraft carry out their missions, that's what's changed. That's what's driven a lot of the changes with the air group size. Realistically, the aircraft carrier is as good a way, and its air groups are as good a way of measuring the last hundred or so years of human technological development as any other. They truly are. In its good points and its bad points. And it's also the reason why I'm fairly certain that carriers are going to be around for a long, long time. Because, as I said in this video, you cannot rearm aircraft in midair. And it's really inefficient to send them out to maximum range, have them launch a strike and have to return. You maybe can do one strike group every day if you're doing that. Unless you've got a lot of aircraft dedicated and you're going to wear out your aircraft very quickly and then hardly going to be on time, any time over target. So don't expect them to do anything more than strike on pre-arranged targets. They're not going to have time to hunt targets. They're not going to have time to do overwatch. And certainly you're not going to be able to maintain enough aircraft in the air to do any kind of air, com uh, any kind of air support. So, on that note... And considering that I always finish my videos with a question, what's today's question? Well, naval aviation. We've seen where it's come to for it. I've talked about how the air group has evolved. And I have mentioned one impact, the multi-role capabilities of land-based air, but what other areas do you think naval aviation has actually leaked into land-based aircraft? What other innovations do you think have come from the naval side to influence the land-based side of aircraft? I'd be really interested to hear what you think. The answer there are some. There are plenty where it goes the other way, land to sea, but there are some which go sea to land for sea-based sea -based aviation to land-based aviation in terms of ideas. For coming next week, next week we have the conception, operation, conclusion of the Lexington class. It's going to be fun. Thank you very much for watching. And if you liked the video, please do like, share, and subscribe. That really does help the channel grow. And if you want to support the book habit, which underpins this whole channel, there's Patreon, there's Kofi, and there's memberships, and they're all gratefully appreciated. Patrons, as always, get to suggest topics uh, for lives, although at the moment they're suggesting topics for the four premieres, first day premieres through July. Which should, people should hopefully enjoy. Hopefully enjoy. Thank you very much for watching and take care.